Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our study of Paul, the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, we, We left off last week in this sixth, we had gone up to the sixth verse in chapter four. So we're going to pick it up today in chapter four, first Timothy chapter four, starting at verse seven and eight. Okay. Okay. And we're going to do that immediately after brother Mark asks God's blessing on our time together. Oh Lord, we just thank you for your word and just reveal what you want to, to us to proclaim and put in this, Bible study for it to go out into the world and to affect others. Just we thank you for your word. Amen. Amen. And to change us. And to change yes. us. And to change us. Yes. Okay, as I said, First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. But have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Worldly fables. Worldly you know, fables. Yeah, Peter, <clears throat> in Second Peter uh, 1.16, he wrote, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Hallelujah. Where was that again? That's Second Peter 1.16. So he's saying specifically that they did not follow cleverly devised tales. All right? Cleverly devised tales. Because that becomes, that's how you deceive somebody. I mean, if, it, if you don't craft it and, and, you know, bend it to make it look as close to the real thing as possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, How are you going to fool anybody? But remember, the first revelation of the devil in Scripture is that he was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the field, right? So he's not going to try and always smack you right in the face with some gigantic lie at it. No. No. He will take that proverbial glass of pure water and add a little bit of poison to it because that's all it takes, right? That's right. The dictionary says that a tale or a fable like this mm-hmm. is a story not founded on fact. Okay. okay? That means it's, it's, it's crafted. I have to tell you, the church today, the traditions of the church mm-hmm. today that are not based on Scripture, and when I say based on Scripture, I mean that they adhere to right. the account in Scripture. They're fictions that are cleverly designed to keep power by the ones who have crafted them. Remember, Peter said, uh, he's talking about when he made known the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to distract you. I'm talking about people in the church want to distract you from the power of God. So you focus on their power. Okay. Um, I'm I'm not going to get into this too much, but... I, I don't just want to say, I mean, I have to say, I am compelled to say, mm-hmm. I am driven to say. <laughs> if you look at how the celebration of Christmas and Easter take place, because those are the quote unquote two biggies in the church, okay? Mm-hmm. Yes. Only in the church, not in scripture, okay? Right. There's so much fable in there. Mm-hmm. There's so much that is just not, does not line up with the truth of scripture. Right. And we need to be so careful about that. You know, I, if I can sit here and tell you, as I do so often, don't trust me. Test me. Test what I say. Make sure that what I'm telling you is Scripture mm-hmm. or lines up with the Scripture. That it didn't come out from out of left field somewhere, all right? Jesus, you know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his time, in Mark chapter 7, he talked to them and he said, you know, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your traditions. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, then, the, the traditions were in conflict with, with, the word. with the word, with the commandments of God. Right. That's still true today. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, and Satan hasn't come up with any new ideas. 
right? It just keeps wrapping them in different packages. Right. So how how can you protect yourself? Because when it says that these are cleverly devised, mm -hmm. okay, that means somebody's going through an awful lot of effort to bend this into a story work it into, that'll be yeah. be acceptable, like a con man. And I've always said, you know, Satan, he comes as a thief, but he's a very particular kind of thief. Mm -hmm. He's a con man. He has to make something very attractive he has, because he has no power over you. Yeah. He can't he can't bonk you on the head and take what's rightfully yours. He has to talk you into giving up what's rightfully yours. Mm -hmm. All right, and he does that with cleverly devised tales, yeah, tales, fables. Yeah, tales yeah. and fables. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, it starts with, as it says right here in that verse, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself, either bodily or spiritually, all right? Because traditions are hard to let go of. Very, very hard. Yeah. Because they become they become a part of us. Right. And that's why we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Mm -hmm. Because most of the traditions that are a problem in the church have been carried for, you know, it's like I had those traditions. I was paying attention to those traditions before I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ Amen. and the Word of That's God. Right. Right? You know who carries it forward? The old women, which says right well, in the no, it's, it's like old women. Like old women. <clears throat> like old well, women. Yeah, they're exactly. the ones that have seen this tradition over and over again, and that's it's the one, they're the ones that it's most instilled in. Well, I, I don't know about that. That's, I, don't I don't know. Really. That's what they're they're just saying, like because like old women sometimes they sit around and they just talk about things that. Like the old guys in yeah. small towns sit around the cracker barrel. And, exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, because remember, enough. the origin of all of this is that one who is the father of lies. Okay? Right. right. All, all of it originates with him. Every, every one of these fables, because he is more crafty, more subtle than any other beast of the field, they all originate with him. And this is why we need to be on guard. How can you be on guard? You discipline yourself. What does that mean to discipline yourself? How much time do you spend in the Word of God? How much time? Mm -hmm. Because the simple fact is, I mean, think about the words of Jesus Christ. He said, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. But that means you have to d discipline yourself to spend time in the Word of God. And trust me, and I, I don't say this I, in condemnation. I say this as uh, ho hopefully encouragement. an encouragement. Visiting a church building for an hour or two a, a week and listening to a 15-minute sermon from your, your pastor, that's not necessarily abiding in the Word of God by any means. No. And you know that. Of course. You, you know that. Mm -hmm. So, how, you know, how much time do you spend in the Word? That's it. You have to, you have to discipline yourself to do that. Yes, you got to discipline yourself. You know, it says that Jesus, he was in the habit. It was his, it was his habit. He get up early in the morning and go out to pray, because Satan doesn't want you in the Word, so he will distract you every which way. That's why we have to oh, discipline ourselves. I feel ourselves. like sleeping a little more. <laughs> no, I, you know, I want to pick up the Bible, but you know, there's a baseball game on. You've got to discipline yourself. Now, fortunately, like I said. When God calls you to do something, he equips you to do that thing. Mm -hmm. And and Paul will write to Timothy in his next letter, mm -hmm. and he'll say, God hasn't given us a, a, a spirit of fear, but of power, of, of boldness, of a sound mind. Um, that sound mind in the King James is translated in the American Standard as, as discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because that's what a sound mind does. It disciplines. It seeks discipline. David, a man after God's own heart, prayed in the Psalms, and he, he said, he prayed that God would send people, if he was off, he said that he would send brothers into his life to correct him, to discipline him. Yes. And he said, and let my, not my head refuse it. it. Right. Because I'm going to tell you something, your body doesn't like it. No, no. But in the natural, if you discipline yourself in the natural, if you get in the habit of exercising, boom, ba -da -boom, ba -da -boom, ba -da -boom, mm -hmm. I, I remember those days, right? You get to a point where it's no longer a chore. It's something that you look forward to. You desperately look forward to. Right.
because it, it because of what it's doing in your body. Right. If you discipline yourself for godliness, you, you will be more. you'll want more and more and more. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Because bodily discipline is of little, little value. value. Right. It doesn't say it's not of any value, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. But it's it's only little compared to spiritual discipline is profitable for all things. That's what it says. Because that's what we are. We're spirits. We're not flesh. There's very little discipline in the world today. Yeah. Uh, there really is. I mean, it, it's it's something that has become uh, demonized here in America. Mm -hmm. And cultivated out of us. Well, that's <clears throat> what I mean. One of, and that takes place in the in the in the households, it takes place in the schools, mm -hmm. okay. Because we have we our culture, not me. Our culture has bought into this lie that discipline is punishment. Right. Yeah. Discipline is discipling. Mm -hmm. It is training, and the word of God is profitable for training in righteousness to be discipled. I mean. Go read. Take time on your own. Go read Hebrews chapter 12 and see and where it says that God disciplines those he, he loves. And if he doesn't discipline you, you're not a son. Mm -hmm. And he disciplines us so that we might partake in his holiness. That's what, he, well, that's what we are supposed to be. That, holy. Be holy. That, so that's not, not punishment. Good. That's be not holy. punishment. I, I promise you. That's right. Well, you know, let me read that to you from Hebrews 12. I'm going to read Hebrews 12, 10, and 11. Talking about our, our natural parents, it says, For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Mm -hmm. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it leads to the peaceable fruit of righteousness. We should seek, like David, we should seek that discipline in our lives, yes. Yes. not shy away from it, all right? All right, so in verse 9 now, Paul says, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. What he's spoken and what he's about to be, it's, this is a trustworthy statement. Mm -hmm. Now, is he saying you better trust me? No. Is he saying, Paul, is it Paul saying, boy, you better trust Paul? No. Trustworthy statement. Psalm 119, <clears throat> verse 160 says this, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. You want truth? The sum of God's word is truth. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, it said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that if you abide you in the word, all right, if you stay constant in the word, you're not going to be troubled. You're not going to, you're not going to be anxious about things. You're not going to be fearful. You're not going to be Troubled, you know? No, there's no, there's no fear. There won't be any fear. I mean, how many drugs are sold today? I mean, that are just there to keep you from, to fight anxiety. Right. Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. That's a command of God. Mm -hmm. We should never be anxious because that's a sign of our lack of faith, our lack of trust in him. Mm -hmm. The evidence abounds that confirms the truth of those verses that I just read. But what matters now is whether or not you believe them. Right. Okay? Full acceptance. Uh, full acceptance. Call to mind now. Is this not called to mind? The centurion who sought Jesus out because his servant was sick, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He asked Jesus to heal his... Well, I, I, hope, I pray you know the account, but... You know, in, in Matthew chapter 8, if you don't know it, go read it, all right? Jesus commended the faith of that centurion. He said he hadn't found such great faith in all of Israel. But I want to, I want to read it in Matthew 8, 13, which says, And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. Mm -hmm. 
and the servant was healed that very moment. You want to know something? God's word is trustworthy. Absolutely. It's absolutely trustworthy if you believe it. Mm -hmm. But you have to believe it. Okay? And if, you, if you're into Romans 10, 9 and 10, you not only have to believe it, you got to confess it. you got to believe it in your heart, and you got to confess it with your mouth. All right? Mm -hmm. I don't remember where this is, but there was a man whose son was needed healing. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I believe, but help, help my unbelief. Help yes. So that's a prayer that we can yeah. when you're having a problem. A absolutely. Okay. Um, it, if you don't understand that all of God's word deserves your full acceptance, full acceptance, you probably will later, you will later on, right? right. right. That's what John wrote so long ago. You're gonna, you know why you're going to know? Listen for the hoofbeats in the yes. sky. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. God's, the name of our Lord and Savior is Faithful oh, and true. true. How can you question what he has spoken? He never fails. He never, ever fails. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it says that not one promise that he has promised has failed to come to pass. That's right. Is it contingent on you believing? No. Well, well in, in, in your life, life. In yes, your life, in it, your is. life it is. Yeah. Yes, but not for it to come to pass. No. It, his, his word is settled in heaven. Right. What God has spoken is going to come to pass. He said it. That settles it. Yeah. <laughs> So in verse 10 and 11, then, 1 Timothy 4, 10 and 11, it says, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. This is what he's saying to his son in the faith, Timothy, right? But Paul says we labor and strive. The King James translates that word, the Greek word there for, for strive, as we suffer reproach. Mm. We're supposed to count the cost. You're supposed to know that when you've made a friend of Jesus, you made an enemy of somebody else. Right? That one who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour. But we are to we are we are to be faithful and to strive for these things, okay? And just one in my in verse eleven where it says prescribe. I have a footnote and it says keep commanding and teaching. Yeah, we're gonna get that in a second. Oh, okay. So. No. Okay. Do you strive? This is about the discipline again. Do you mm -hmm. strive for the things of God? Ecclesiastes nine ten, the writing of that wise old one Solomon says, whatever your hand finds to do. Do it with all your might. And Paul in Colossians, Colossians 3.23 said, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Mm -hmm. That means with all your heart. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not supposed to be lazy, okay? We're supposed to be diligent in doing the things that God calls us to do. And if you don't believe that, again, this is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And maybe if the Bible study is not working for you, go out and find yourself an anthill. Mm -hmm. yes. And look at it, go because the, the word, because the word of God says, "Go to the ant, O sluggard. Yeah. Observe her ways and be wise. Which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? Mm -hmm. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little, a little folding of the hands to rest. Mm -hmm. Your poverty will come like a vagabond." And your need like an armed man. Mm. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. This is the word of God. Yes. We're, we're supposed to be a diligent people. Mm -hmm. Working. Okay. Well, where's that work start? Oh, I, believing. I, in believing. Mm -hmm. Because he, listen, the disciples, they wanted to be doing the work of God. Mm -hmm. Because they were faithful in their hearts. So they came to Jesus and said, tell us. What shall we do that we can do the works of God? He said, believe on the one the Father said, believe on him. He's saying, believe on me. Because that's the heart and that's the start of everything. Because if you're doing it and it's not based on your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's all vanity. Yes. 
I, this is like homework again. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul says, if I give everything I have, if I, you know, to, Do not have but love. don't have love, it profits me nothing. I'm like a clanging cymbal, all right? Then it said, the living God, Savior of all men. Did he save all men? Is everybody saved? Well, he made the opportunity. Aha, uh -huh. he made the opportunity. God is, first of all, the living God. Yes, he is. He's not dead. No. Mm -mm. All false gods okay. are dead. <laughs> yes, they are. And by the way, even people can be dead well, walking. walking. Yeah, the zombies. Well, they are. Satan has no creative power. The whole concept of zombies comes from Scripture. Yes. Where it talks about people who don't have the life of God breathed into them. Mm -hmm. They are dead walking in their trespasses. Mm -hmm. It's just a carcass walking around. False gods were never alive, so I guess they're dead because they are false gods. They're a, they're a figment of somebody's imagination. Are you trying to say a fable or a, yes, a, 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 a cleverly devised, cleverly devised, cleverly devised fable? Yes, yeah. they, they are. But that's why God said, "I mean, you know, why why would you go and seek something that's that's dead? Mm -hmm. Or pray to something that's or, dead? Or pray to something? Yes." Okay. No, the simple answer is not everybody is saved. But that doesn't change the fact that God took away the sins of the world. Yes. The whole world. Yes. So that whosoever will believe in him will have eternal life. That's John 3.16. So he made it possible. He brought salvation for and mm -hmm. to all men. Right. All mankind. For whosoever will accept it, receive it. He desires that none should perish. That's what Peter writes in 2 Peter uh, 3 9, right? But he also reveals that most, not a few, most will not believe in him. Mm -hmm. That's, That's Matthew right. 7, right? That's why it's, there's the wide road. The wide road. Many choose to follow that as opposed to the straight, narrow road that leads to life, Which and few follow find. that. So. But, okay, just as an aside here. Okay. Remember that it says, those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Yes. They're accepting him, right? Mm -hmm. But how will they call on him if they've not heard of him? And how will they hear if it's not preached? And how will it be preached if it's people not are not sent? Mm -hmm. So get out your checkbook and write a check for $8 billion to the evangelist to go out. No, oh, you know what I know something? He has sent you. That's right. He has sent you into the workplace, into the marketplace, into your house. He has sent you. And you have, if you know Jesus Christ, you have the words of eternal life because he has given you them and he has written them on the tablets of your heart. You are the one that's got to go out and tell people about the name of the Lord. Can't pass it off. No. Well, I mean, it's it's good. To, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's good that if you support the gospel. No, yes. But yes. the fact is that doesn't relieve you of your own responsibility. Uh, yes, right. You can't okay? do that instead of. Yeah, you can't pay somebody to do what God has called you to do. to do. Right. And you are to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. I hope you get that. With every opportunity that the Lord gives us. Amen. So just... You've got to be a faithful witness. And then he goes on to say, let no one, this is, I'm in verse 12 now, right? Okay. Verse 12 says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. We bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Mm -hmm. The church is the visible presence of Christ Jesus everywhere. Yes. You are the visible presence of Christ Jesus wherever you go. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. But you have to demonstrate that in your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity. Okay? Mm -hmm. To Timothy, he's saying, don't be dis you know, don't look down, don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness. Yeah. Well, he can call you in your youth. Yes. That's what he did with Timothy. Yes. He also did that with Jeremiah. Yes. First chapter of Jeremiah. With David. David was a young man, right? God can call him. He called Moses 
when he was 80 years old to start that ministry. There's, there's, there's no one God can't use. I mean, and it's not dependent. What it's saying is don't let people say you can't be doing this because you're too young. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be doing it because you're too old. If you're drawing breath and are filled with the spirit, that is the breath of God. And I'll tell you what, you can. Yes. Okay. He equips us. Yes. So the important thing is that when he calls you, you respond. You must then be a faithful witness. 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Uh, the AV, the King James says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. All right? That goes back to the discipline. You, it's not, this is not just to Timothy. We need to be abiding in the Word. Mm -hmm. And what God is putting in us needs to flow out. Right. Okay? Otherwise, it's a dead sea. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And you, you have to remember that it's talking about not just apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers when it says that the tongue of the righteous is a fountain of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to bring life into every place and every person that you go if you let that living water flow through you out to touch other lives. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get right down here quickly to verse 14 and 15. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with a laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so your progress will be evident to all. The spiritual gift within you. This is not a matter of being having a, a title on a business card. Right. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, talking to the entire body of Christ, he said, yeah. but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Right. It's not for you, it's for the others. For the common good. Right. And then he goes on, that was verse 7, in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Mm -hmm. If you're saved, you got a gift. Mm -hmm. And that gift is to be used for the glory of God and the benefit of the rest of the church, for the, for the benefit of others. Amen. Now, if you lost sight of that, just remember that anybody can do that. Because Paul would have to write to Timothy in the next letter remind yeah. and remind them. And he said in 2 Timothy 1.6, in his next letter, he says, For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Well, I, I don't want to get too much into that because there's so much there mm -hmm. to kindle afresh. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you kindle a fire, well, you know what? I learned how to put fires out. You remove the heat, you remove the, the fuel, you remove the oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's how you, you got to make sure that yeah. those things are yeah, at work. Hey, you know what? I want to come back and talk about that as we get into our next study. All right, that would be good. Yeah, because that's, that's worthy of a little bit of time. Yeah. But until then... Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. We thank you that you still choose the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. We thank you that you can work in our lives and through our lives. Lord, that you give us gifts, that we're not dependent on our own wisdom, or, but Lord, that we can be disciplined, we can follow, we can be discipled by you to go out and work for the glory of your name. We praise you and thank you, Father. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Jesus.